Okay, so uh, here I am in England, uh, in front of my fire. I guess you guys in New York would appreciate this, being like zero degrees. And what I want to talk to you about today is a very interesting insight and a story at the same time. The story is about Al Gore, and not about global warming, although it would be appropriate with this weather, but rather about how we launched Current TV, and more significantly, what it was supposed to be, what it turned into, and what I think it bodes for the future. All these are fairly important points. So around the year 2000, I had this idea to start kind of a video bar and cafe. I thought it would be interesting to have a place where people would come in, get a beer, get a cup of coffee. In those days, before their iPhones, where we could give out, you know, um, uh, video cameras and, and, and have edits. We had... Uh, um, uh, um, final Cut edit station set up, and we had a big screen, and we had screenings, and the whole idea was sort of the democratization of video. It was kind of a, I guess it was a physical brick and mortars version of YouTube, because it was before YouTube. It was around the year 2000 when we started this thing, and I didn't really know where to put it and what to do it. I'd never done anything like this before, but I got this fantastic real estate agent who said, I know just the place for this thing. And it was on Bowery, on the Bowery, which in those days was still full of homeless people and single room occupancies. And she said, I, I got to introduce you to this guy because he's the perfect guy for you. And I thought, all right. So I went down and I had lunch with this guy and his wife. And he looked like a homeless person to me. And she looked like a homeless person. But they had this storefront across the street from CBGB, which was the great home of, of, uh, of punk rock. And so, you know, I thought, well, this might work out. And he wanted to share the space with me. Anyway, turned out his name was Bob Holman. He launched the Bowery Poetry Club. He's still there. The guy was brilliant. And his wife, who looked like a homeless person, was actually Elizabeth Murray. She's since passed away. But she was this very famous artist, and her painting sold for like a million dollars a painting. So shows you what an idiot I was. Anyway, I made the deal with Bob, and we opened this thing called DV Dojo, because it was DV in those days, and Dojo, because I was like, I don't know, karate school. So I was an idiot. I probably could have come up with a better name. But we started to take people in, and we taught them the kind of stuff we teach them in the boot camp, and you get a muffin, you get a coffee, and you can get a beer, and you could hang out, and we had screenings. It was like a little clubhouse, you know, before there was online community. So anyway, I should have gone online. That's another story. Anyway, one day this guy walks in, this big guy, big guy, I mean, I'm a little guy. He was a big guy named Jamie Daves. And he said, you know, I want to talk to you about video. And, and so you know, I said, all right, sure, you know, so I got nothing else to do. Let's have a cup of coffee and a muffin. It's free. And uh, uh, let's talk. So I told him, you know, I gave him the old Gutenberg rap and the revolution that was coming and all this stuff. And he went away. And then the next day he called me up and he said, um, I represent former Vice President Al Gore. Well, Gore had just lost the election, I mean, like the day before. And he said, the vice president would like to meet with you. Do you have a place you could meet? So I said, ah, come to my loft. I had a loft in Soho. So the next day, I'm sitting in my loft and, you know, ding dong, the doorbell rings. And it's got this little video monitor that lets you see who's there. And I go inside and <laughs> there on the monitor, that's Al Gore. It's like watching him on TV. And he's got a pocket protector and pens in it. And he goes, Al Gore here. So I just buzzed him. I said, come on up, man. So he came up in, into my loft, right? And he said, Al Gore, the guy had just lost, he'd been the vice president of the United States. He'd just lost the election. And he, he, I said, I have a cup of coffee. Sit down, we'll talk. So he sat in my living room and he said, I'm thinking of starting a TV channel. It's going to be about politics or uh, uh, history. And I said, Al, that idea sucks, man. I said, well, what do you think I should do? And I said, there's this revolution going on. Everybody's starting to shoot their own video, and you should make a channel based on that. So we had this long talk, and I gave him the whole rap. And then I'd hear from him. Then a week later, he called me up. He said, what are you doing next week? I said, I'm not doing anything. He said, why don't you come out to, to Deer Valley? And he was there with Joel Hyatt, his business partner, and their wives. Joel was married to Susan Metzenbaum. She was the daughter of the senator from Ohio. And, and Tipper was there, who is a lovely person. And so I went out, and I brought a little video camera with me and little laptops, and I taught, taught Al and Joel and Tipper and Susan how to shoot video. We ran around Deer Valley, and we shot little videos like Cut the Carrots and in a, you know, in, 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 in the same crap we do all the time. And so he got it. And so we launched Current TV. And the idea for Current TV was we were going to democratize the medium. It was a little ahead of its time. In fact, it was ahead of YouTube. It was so far ahead of its time. And, you know, all right, I sold it to the, the Qataris for a lot of money. But it didn't really do what I wanted to do. And, and the reason it didn't want to do, it was not ready. The technology was not ready. The technology is ready now. And mostly this is because of iPhones and smartphones. iPhones and smartphones, they are the defining 
altering technology that changes the entire television and media and video and online landscape because suddenly everybody has a camera and everybody has an edit system everybody uses them all the time. So the opportunity now exists to take the, what was a system in which very, very few people got their hands on the stuff. Pardon me, I'll tend to my fire here for a minute. Very few people got their hands on the stuff and, and you had to depend on networks and CBS and stuff like that to make the video and you didn't own it. You, you know, maybe a couple of people had a video camera, but for the most part, television and video content were made by them and your job was to watch it, which is a stupid job in some ways. It's not very, it's passive and it teaches you passivity. Your job is to sit and let all the stuff wash over you, but you had no control over the medium. So I've always had this idea that, that we could create a very different kind of architecture for the world of television and video and journalism because it's so important because it's how we find out about the world. So anyway, as, as you probably know, if you've been watching this before, we're going to launch this thing called Brooklyn Television, which is actually based in, in East New York and Brownsville. And we're going to go out there and we are going to teach all the people who live in the community to shoot and cut their own video on their own. Now, the weird thing is that in the old days, we have to, br we have to bring these giant pelican cases with cameras and laptops. And even when I did DV Dojo, it was a physical place that required lo buying lots of Apple computers and buying lots of Sony cameras. But now everybody in the world has one. We went out to Brownsville about three weeks ago and we had a meeting with people who were interested in participating in this new community channel. And about 60 people showed up and I said, who here has a smartphone? Everybody raised their hand. Who has a smartphone that shoots video? Everybody raised their hand. So I said, we now have 60 cameras ready to go into play. It's just the very first meeting. We're gonna have another one on Saturday the 20th, and I expect 100 people to show up for this thing, if not more. That means 100 cameras. The more people who wanna participate, the better. Now, here's what makes it like an Uber. The, people talk about disruptive technologies, you know, like Uber is a disruptive technology, Airbnb is a disruptive technology, and people think what makes them disruptive is the app, and you know, we have to build an app, we have to make an app, let's get it, it's a bullshit, it has nothing to do with an app, what makes a disruptive technology is you find an existing asset that has never been used before, so with Uber, there were millions of cars floating around that are actually set idle all the time, and with, with, um, with uh, Airbnb, there was a million hotel rooms or rooms in people's houses that sat around that nobody used, so it was sitting idle all the time. And what Airbnb did and what eBay did and, and what, what Uber did was they plugged into this existing asset that nobody had used and they used the internet to connect all these people up. Well, if you look at Brownsville, there's probably a thousand professional video camera and edit units just in that little community that are sitting idle and unused. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tap into those things. I'm going to put them to work. I'm going to put them to work making content. A thousand cameras, 2,000 cameras. Why not? It's entirely possible. And I'm going to make sure all the people who make the content are going to get paid. This is not a non-for-profit. This is not a YouTube where one guy makes $10 million, everybody else gets screwed. Everybody who makes content will get paid for the content and it's going to be advertiser driven. I'll explain this in another talk because I don't want to take up all your time, but trust me, it works. And the reason I'm keeping it, I want to keep it small. It, it, up so far in the internet, we've built giant things. We build Facebook and we build Google and they're enormous. And the problem with enormous things is they're not very community oriented. Human beings, by definition, are community oriented. They like little communities. And if you look at the history of newspapers in America, like Gannett, newspapers served a purpose for a community. They didn't serve the purpose for the planet. And so when we get the internet, I'm going to the opposite extreme. Richard Feynman, who is one of my favorite writers, he said a great thing. He was a physicist, but he said that there's plenty of room at the bottom. And so that's where I'm headed. I'm headed for building a little tiny community. I don't want this Brooklyn TV to go encompass the whole world. I want China, people in China watching Brooklyn TV. But I want people in Brooklyn, particularly in East New York and Brownsville, to have a place that is their home that they can go to. They can talk to each other. They can express issues that are interest. And of course, merchants who have stores and stuff, pizza places or restaurants, they're also part of the community. So I want to build an online video-driven community based on everyone having smartphones and using them not to do Instagram and not to watch CBS and anywhere, but instead to create content and share it, which essentially is what things like Uber do and it's what, uh, what uh, Airbnb does to share the asset. So we're going to tap into the asset. Now, the important thing here is this is a model and it's a scalable model because if I can make it work in East New York, I can make it work in Newark, I can make it work in Oakland, I can make it work in Miami, I can make it work in Norway, I can make it work anywhere. So this thing in Brooklyn is really very important to me. If you would like to participate in this, if you would like to be part of this, 
email me. I'm looking for people who want to get involved. This is a very, very early, but I think it's a great idea. And I think it's an idea whose time has come, unlike current TV, which is an idea kind of ahead of its time. But now I think we've caught up. And this notion of taking the power of video away from the people at CNN and CBS and places like that and putting it into the hands of everyone and having people getting paid for their work. It doesn't have to be news. It can be music. It can be sports. It can be entertainment. It can be anything you want to be. Um, uh, the, Brett has just put up the link. Go to check out BKTV. Um, uh, January 20th, George Gershwin Junior High School in Brooklyn, 800 Van Sicklin Avenue. If you need details, come and we're going to have a big meeting and I'm going to explain how all this works. I'm going to be signing people up to be the first in on this entirely new and revolutionary uh, experiment in a television network, but I think it's going to work. And even if it doesn't work perfectly, we're going to kind of work it out and make it work. There's Andre Zalbertis, who is my friend from Germany. Andre, if we can build one in Brooklyn, we can build several. We can build many across all of Germany. I think the model will work. It's a completely different concept, but we're going to take a shot at it, and I hope you'll be there. If you have any questions, shoot me an email. i got to get my fire back and running. I'll talk to you later. I hope you enjoyed that, and if you want to learn more and see more, Come and see us at thevj.com.